is indeed a pleasure to be up here. Don't be fooled, I'm outside of my comfort zone. <laughs> but I think God has, some, I, I know God has something to say. And if you've asked God to speak to you today, then He's going to, hopefully, He will use me to speak to you. And I, this is what I try to do every week, whoever's preaching, beginning at the beginning of the week, right after Sabbath, I start praying for the sermon and for the church on Sabbath. And I ask God to give me a message for whoever's preaching. And whoever's up here, it doesn't matter. If you disagree with them or you don't like them, or God will still speak to you if you ask Him to. Because He loves you. And today's message, this fan's going to blow my stuff away, but that's okay. Let me track it down. The Gospel. And I, I, I debated on whether that should be an exclamation point or a question mark. The Gospel. Is it good news or good advice? Well, the dis dispensationalism, that's a big word for me, dispensationalism, that came out in the mid-1800s, like around 1850. And what they were trying to say is that the Bible, or the, the, uh, the Old Testament was... Uh, was written for Old Testament people before Christ came. Correct me if I'm wrong. And then the New Testament is for the New Dispensation. And people that think like that like to do away with the Old Testament. Now to get the good news of the Gospel, you, you've got to look at all of Scripture. Now if we go to, uh, let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 3. <coughs> Actually, it's 2 Timothy. Sorry about that. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. And also, if you look at um, when Jesus was speaking to whoever he was speaking to, he would always say, it is written, it is written, it is written. Now when Jesus says it is written, is, is, what's he talking about? Is he talking about this Bible? The Old Testament. So they didn't have a New Testament when he said it is written. And if you look at... Um, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete. It says complete, correct? Thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, when he says that every all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, what is he talking about? Is he talking about this? No, no he's talking about the Old Testament. So, the New Testament church, as they like to call it, their Bible was the Old Testament. Now, if you look at, uh, in Hebrews chapter 4, I'm not sure what verse is, verse 20 or something, it says that, that the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. And I, I'm going to stop there, because if I keep on paraphrasing, I'm going to just mess it up and maybe go read it. But he's talking about the Old Testament. So, let's go to Galatians chapter 3. And we're going to start getting into the message here, uh, the gospel, good news or good advice. Galatians chapter 3. Now when I read this, it was kind of foreign to me when I first read it. I haven't always been an Adventist. And I just used to just read right through it. And we're at verse 8. And it says, And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, Preach the gospel to Abraham. Now, how's that possible? Did he preach the gospel to Abraham? I thought the gospel was Jesus dying on the cross. 
you know, that's the way the dispensationalists think. That that's, this is where the gospel came in. But let's look at what, what is the gospel. It's the good news. It's God's good news to the human race. It's not just the good news to... When He spoke the good news to Adam and Eve, He was speaking to us because we were in Adam and Eve. If you look at Paul's writings, the in Christ motive, I don't know if I said it, motive, motif, the in Christ, if you understand that, you can under, you pretty much understand the gospel. Because if you look at in the garden when God made the human race, he had the whole human race was in Adam. Even Eve was in Adam. And when Eve was taken out of Adam, he took, took the rib, he made Eve. Did, did he have to breathe the breath of life into, into Eve? I mean, that, no, I, you know, the scripture's silent about it, but I would like to think that, that this was still a living rib, so there was no breath of life needed. It was already alive, so there was only one being that, that God breathed into, and that was Adam. That's kind of fascinating. Now, we were all in Adam, and if you read... Uh, Acts chapter, I think it's 1726. You might want to quote me on that. Yeah. Anyway, 1726 says that we were all made from one blood. So we all came from Adam. Actually, we all came from Noah. But, of course, Noah came from Adam. But you can trace your lineage all the way back to Noah and then, and then, and then back to Adam. And if you take the in Adam, and what, what happened at the incarnation is uh, God decided to, in, to enter the stream of, hu of humanity. And He had to become a man. And when the incarnation is when Mary conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, what happened was God was taken, Jesus was taken, and He was put into that stream. And it changed the whole stream of humanity. It put, the, it's like, if this Bible is Jesus, and this pencil is the human race, we were put into Jesus. The whole human race was put into Jesus. But, that's not the good, it is good news, but that's not the good news, because not everybody believes that. So not everybody's going to be in heaven, because not everybody accepts Jesus as their Savior which is uh, the unpardonable sin, actually. Uh, good news or good advice? Now, it says that the, the gospel was given to Abraham. Now, we should be able to go back in the Old Testament and find the gospel. If you look in the garden, you can find the gospel in the garden, but I'm not going to go quite, I'm not going to go back that far. But if you go to, to Genesis chapter, chapter 12, Three. 
And, and, and it's funny how when, until, it, until I became an Adventist, I just read right through this stuff and just didn't even think about it. It says, verse 29 of chapter 3 says, And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So it wasn't the people that... The, the, bless you. And it wasn't the people that were of the, of the same genetics as Abraham... What, was it the people, that, was it genetics of Abraham? The, the sons and daughters of Abraham that were genetically his? Or was it the, the, the people of the promise? What does it say right here? It says, heirs according to the promise. So it was spiritual Abraham. And, you can, and, we can, and we're, we're going to go to the Jewish nation also just briefly. But the good news of the gospel was given to our father. He's called the, our spiritual father, Abraham. And that's where the, the promise of uh, making him a great nation, we're, we're that great nation. Let's go to uh, let's see our, our scripture reading today. Now let's go to, if you look in the bulletin, there's a, uh, another scripture reading on the left side. It's, it's Exodus chapter 19, verse 5. And I'm always quoting this verse. I quote it quite a bit. People, members of the church and those Bible studies I get tired of hearing it, but I don't get tired of it. It says, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all the people, for all the earth is mine. And this is God talk. It's capitals. My is capital. My covenant. My voice. Me above all people. What he's saying, I'm going to paraphrase it this time. I'm going to read it in the way, the way I see it. It says, Now therefore, if you will indeed listen to me attentively. That word obey, if you look it up, we like to see that word, you know, that's something, that's kind of a negative word in our society. You know, obey, obey me. That's kind of negative. But if you look at it the way God means it, here God's saying, listen, please listen to me. Now, I'm trying to tell you something. He says, listen to my voice. And when he says, keep my covenant, that word keep, if you look it up, it means um, appreciate. Um, cherish. Cherish, protect. It, it's, uh, if you look in the, in, when Adam and Eve were put in the garden, they were to keep the garden. And it was to cherish it, protect it, appreciate it. So what God's saying here, he says, now therefore, if you will indeed, and I, I want to back, let me finish this. It says, if you will indeed obey my voice, if you will indeed listen to me attentively and appreciate what I'm telling you about my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. He's trying, he, he's, he's pleading with the people to, he said, I'm going to make you these special people. <clears throat> it's going to be me. And he's pleading with, with, with us today in the Adventist church. I, I'm going to, I want to make you special. Allow me. Invite me in. In Revelation 3.20, I'm way ahead of myself now. He says, he says, I'm knocking on the door of your heart. He says, let me come in. I open the door. You know, when Paul was on the road to Damascus, he was on his way to kill more Christians, put them in jail, or do whatever he did to them. And he, was, he, was, he thought he was doing the right thing. And nothing, nothing could have changed Paul. Nothing on this face of this earth could have changed his attitude. Nothing about him. And I'd like to, to submit, there's nothing on the face of this earth that could change you. You know, it's, it's in psychology, I won't go there. We, we cannot change ourselves. It, it says in, Revel, in Romans 6.16 6, that you are servants to the one that you submit yourself to. If you submit yourself to Satan, then you, you, you're going to sin. If you submit yourself to Christ, we don't have the power to do right or wrong, but we do have the power to choose who we're going to serve. We make the choice. Christ comes in and makes the change when we make the choice. Losses. We're talking.
talking about Israel. <laughs> oh, I, I, sometimes I get off on these tangents and I lose my place. Forgive me, please. Um, Israel has the, uh, they, they have the chance to allow God to do something for them that they cannot do for themselves. And they answer God back in, in Exodus chapter 19. By the way, this is the chapter just before. In case I get lost again, I'll get a pencil right there. This is the chapter just before the Ten Commandments are given out by God from Sinai. And I, I've been thinking about that a lot lately. You know? and, 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 it, and I've been thinking, did God Himself need to write the Ten Commandments on tables of stone. You don't have to answer that. But if you read all of Scripture, you're not going to steal. You're not going to lie. You're not going to commit adultery. You're going to worship God in the way He prescribes. You're not going to covet. All these things, if you read the Scriptures and let the Scriptures get into your mind and your heart, you have the, the Ten Commandments written in your heart without... Sinai. I thought that was kind of like, whoa. Why did he have to give these Israelites something in stone? He couldn't write it on their hearts. He could not write it in their heart. And that, 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 just, that blew me away. That blows me away. He, because Israel said, what do they say in, in, in verse 8? What are you saying with you? Yeah. It says, Then all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And, and, and that just speaks volumes because when someone makes a promise like God, He makes the promise. He supplies the righteousness. Israel made the promise back to God that they would supply their own righteousness. And they fell miserably. And I'm thinking of one place where they didn't fail so bad, but you know, when Hezekiah, if, if you remember Hezekiah, it seems like Hezekiah had just come out of, of, of being saved by the God, the angel of the Lord came and killed 186,000 men. Uh, it's in 2 Kings chapter 20, I believe. I got a book down here. So not, I, if I stop, it's going to take me too long. But it said, if you look up just like um, Hezekiah, Hezekiah, after 186,000 men, and, and when we pray, we need to pray in accordance to God's will. If, if it's not God's will for you to live, we need to allow God to do His will, if it's to take your life. What does Job say? If though He slay me, I will trust in Him. Well, Hezekiah, he's, he's, he's told he's going to die by Isaiah. <laughs> Isaiah tells him he's going to die. And Hezekiah, he goes to boo -hoo -hoo And he's praying to God. And God's, God hears his prayer. And he says, okay. And he tells Isaiah to go back up. Isaiah had just left Hezekiah and he was leaving. And, and before I, Isaiah gets out of, the, out of the castle, Hezekiah is crying, boo-hoo. I mean, and, and God says, go back up, Isaiah, and tell him he's going to live for 15 more years. God, and that, seems, that sounds like a good thing. And it's not really a good thing because he has what he has the meanest king his son is the is that he had in those 15 years is one of the meanest kings that has ever been in Israel I can't remember exactly what it says about him but it, it, it's not nice and uh, he has all and, and, and God's upset and God lets him live and he reigns for 50 years well Satan's been reigning for 6,000 so we need to remember that that sin has to play itself out because if we don't learn to hate sin, then it's going to happen again. So God is allowing the sin experiment to play out. Now Hezekiah has a son Manasseh, and he dies after 
serving for 50 years. And he has another son. I have got to have one of those. Now he has, a, he has Manasseh, and he reigns for 50 years. And then Ammon, uh, Manasseh is 12 years old when he came to, to, to the kingdom. And then Ammon is 22 years old, and he's, he's as bad as his dad. And then they have Josiah. Have you ever heard of good king Josiah? I, I, anyway, Josiah finds the law. Well, one of his priests finds the law, and he reads it. And, and Josiah says, whoa, we're not doing all this. And so they start doing it. So uh, Josiah uh, is one of the greatest kings that Israel has ever had. And after he dies, he has another bad son. But if you go to uh, 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 26. It says, and, and this is sad. It says, Nevertheless, the Lord did not turn from the fierceness of His great wrath with which His anger was aroused against Judah because all of the provocations which Manasseh had, which Manasseh had provoked him. See, he's remembering back. Josiah has a good rulership, but Manasseh messed things up so bad that God says, And the Lord said, I will also remove Judah from my sight as I have removed Israel. So if you look at the world today, the dispensationalists are saying that everybody said, look at Israel. God's going to bless Israel. But if you read right here, and if you remember, what did Jesus say the last time he left the temple? Your temple's not desolate. He says, your house is left to you desolate. So Israel as a nation is, is not going to be saved. It's going to be Israel... Uh, individuals. Individually we can be saved. Corporately, Israel will not be saved. Let's, let's get to the good news because that's not very good. <laughs> uh, our, our scripture reading for today is uh, John 14, 10. And this is one of my favorite scriptures also. Because it, 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 it shows you that Jesus never used His power or His divinity when He was here on earth. If you read uh, John 14, 10, it says, Do not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in Me. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in Me? The words that I speak to you I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Now, let's go to Philippians. And we talked about this a little bit in our Bible study on Tuesday night. Philippians chapter 2. And Nikki, you remember this. We talked about it. Chapter 2, verses 10. Philippians chapter 2, verse, verse 12. It says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You know, if you stop there, you're lost. You're just lost. I mean, I used to read it like that. And I said, man, i got to work it all out. i got to work this thing out. And then, and then if you go to verse 13, it's, and it speaks volumes. It says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. So God does the work. So, so uh, what, i, I got to ask this question. What's my job? Just like so God's going to do for me what I can't do for myself. Is that it? Yeah. Is that good news? Yeah. Or is that good advice? good news. God's going to do for me what I can't do for myself. Okay, now if you go back to uh, 1410, it says basically the same thing, except it's Jesus talking here. Jesus says that it is God who does the works. 
So when Jesus says in Revelation 3.21, this is so, this is good stuff. In Revelation 3.21 says, To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame. You mean I gotta overcome the way Jesus overcame? Wait a minute. Well, Jesus tells us how he overcame. He submitted himself to the Father. He's, he's asking us to do the same thing. He says, overcome the way I overcame. And what did Jesus overcome? Let's go to John 16, 33. John 16, 33 says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace in the world. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So Jesus, it says, why did Jesus overcome? He overcame the world. And what is the world? Let's go to 1 John 2.16. 1 John 2.16. Okay, this tells us what the world is. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it is of the world. So, what's the world? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. You know, there's people that are not in our church right now over, over prideful things. Pride will keep you from a lot. Your arrogance, your ego, your, as Ray says, I love when he says it, your ego is not your amigo. <laughs> <laughs> And it's true, our egos keep us from, from God. Because we can't let go. If, if we think we have the answers to the problems, and that's what's wrong, that's, that's my carnal nature. That, that's the part that's, that, that's, that controls my sin. So uh, Jesus showed us to, to overcome the world, to overcome the flesh. Now, if we go back to uh, 1410, I want to go to another place where it talks about Jesus in uh, John chapter 8. And it starts with verse 28. Then Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself. There it says again, I do nothing of myself. But as my Father taught me, I am speak of these things. And I want, one other thing I want you to like for you to understand is, is Jesus is our substitute. He, Jesus took our place on the cross. And the only way He could take our place on the cross is if He qualified to be in my place. And the only way He could qualify to be in my place is to have my flesh. So, He went to the cross with the human flesh. He was tempted in every possible way to become to qualify to be my substitute. And if he used his divinity, which I don't have, that's, that was one of Jesus' uh, things. He could not use his divinity or he would disqualify himself to be my substitute. There's so much more I can say about that. But as my Father taught me, I speak these things. And He who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone. I always do the things that please Him. Now how are we, we going to do the things that please God? When He's knocking on the door of your heart, and He's knocking on everybody's heart. You may not be able to hear the knock, but it's, it's, it, what does it say? For God so loved the world. That's everybody. That He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever should believe. So, there's two phases of, of justification. The first part is phase one, and God gave His Son. That's phase one. 
Phase two is our part. What is our part? To believe. Why, why did Israel enter the promised land? Because they didn't believe what God said. He says, I'm going to do this for you. And Israel says, no, we'll do it ourselves. And, and, and don't.